We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Welcome to the IGF, even if uh, in a hybrid uh, manner. Uh, and uh, welcome to the event, uh, which is titled Security of Digital Products, a Coordinated Approach, organized by Diplo Foundation and the Swiss uh, Federal Department of Foreign Affairs on behalf of Geneva Dialogue for Responsible Behavior in Cyberspace. My name is Vladimir Radunovic. I'm the lead of Geneva Dialogue on behalf of uh, Diplo Foundation, and I'll be your host uh, today and moderator of the session. A brief uh, few words about the context of the session. Uh, exploiting vulnerabilities, uh, as we know, is an essential component of sophisticated cyber attacks. So how do we make our digital products and the whole supply chain, the whole digital environment more secure in times of uh, ever greater digitalization, digitalization of steroids, if, if we could put it that way. Geneva Dialogue is uh, leading companies uh, to look at what companies should do, but also connects this to um, standardization issues, uh, regulators, work of diplomats and other stakeholders to discuss how to approach security of digital products more holistically. We'll be talking more about that and also the role of the Geneva Dialogue. Those of you that are frequent at the IGF may recall that Geneva Dialogue uh, had the session last year as well. Um, it was entirely online. This one, I hope, will be with some people in the room. It was supposed to be more in uh, Katowice, but uh, it would be good to hear if there's anyone actually active in the room, let us know. Um, last year, we focused on collecting uh, good practices in the field. This year, we focus on the process. So how do we reconcile or maybe rather combine the perspectives of different stakeholders, connect the existing work of uh, multilateral multi stakeholder fora in the field, and better coordinate uh, this dialogue and, and try to understand who is doing what. Uh, this event is in a way a, a crown of, uh, of the work of Geneva Dialogue this year. So in the second part of the session, we'll reflect more on the particular achievements uh, when we also hear from other active fora who is doing what. The session today will be composed of two parts. So we have 90 minutes total. Uh, the first part, some 45 minutes uh, more or less, will be setting the stage where we want to provide views of various stakeholders about uh, challenges they face related to security of digital products and especially regarding process and, and cooperation. Uh, we'll also hear uh, about the results of the report by the ETHZ CSS on the regulatory trends in the field. And we'll have a lot of hopefully open discussion, which is the point of this um, session. The second part of the session uh, will focus on the open exchange and who is doing what. We'll try to hear from some of the leading fora uh, and try to make sure that we connect the dots. And we would be really happy to have your inputs uh, throughout the session, but particularly in this part, that part as well. Uh, the format of the session is round table uh if you can put anything like a round table in, in the zoom and i see i'm not sure whether actually in, in katowice we have a round table or it's more of a panel setting but treat it as a round table we'll have a few initial addresses and keynotes to set the stage but then we'll turn to uh interactivity as always in, in diplos events so um two ways two means of interaction one is the chat and try to use it to the largest possible extent uh my colleague andreana is a remote moderator or chat moderator rather, what is remote in these times? Is Katowice remote or are we remote? So she's she's a chat moderator. She'll make sure that even discussions and inputs that are not directly questions feed into our discussion, but you can raise also questions and just continue discussing in the chat. At the same time, raise a hand uh, if you want to jump in with any uh, audio video um, contribution, uh, try to be, be brief. Um, and lastly, if since we don't have a full view of the room in Katowice, if there's anyone who uh, wants to take the role of uh, channeling or signaling us when the hand is up in, uh, in the room in Katowice, if those people are not also in Zoom, please uh, help us just uh, ping us in chat and say there is a hand up in, in the room in Katowice and we'll pass the floor there. Uh, let me not take any, any time more. Uh, so I'll move straight to the introductory address. 
And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ambassador uh, Benedict uh, Bachelor, who is the head of division for digitalization Federal Department of Foreign Affairs of Switzerland, uh, to maybe shed a little bit more light on how, what is the relevance, the, let's say political, diplomatic, and general global relevance of uh, the work, not just of Geneva Dialogue, but generally of uh, discussing security of digital products. Uh, how does that connect to norms, principles, and, and all of that? Benedict, the floor is yours. Thank you, Flada. Uh, dear colleagues around the world or in Poland, Katowice, I'm really very pleased and honored to uh, open this uh, session. And of course, I'm regretting also not to be on the ground, especially I've seen some pictures from the, the IGF, band, IGF band yesterday with a prominent Swiss musician also um, on the stage. So that's definitely something we, we need to reconnect, uh, hopefully in person soon. But, you know, I think it's very important, these moments where diplomacy regulators, the private sector, academia and civil society can work together to improve the security of digital products and prevent cyber incidents. And I'm very pleased to see so many dedicated experts take part today. As a government, we are confronted every day with the digital transformation. We are facing many questions about how it can be both efficient and secure to serve our people and humankind as a whole. More often than not, enhancing digital security is a precondition for realizing the human benefits from the digital transformation. So how do we go about that? For Switzerland, it has always been clear that discussions at the international level, the UN, are an important part, vital part of the equation. The consensus reports agree that the group of governmental experts and the open-ended working group chaired by Swiss Ambassador Jörg Lauber early this year are an important milestone. And we're just about to start discussions in the framework of a new open-ended working group and we'll have their first substantive session next week, next week under the chairmanship of Singapore's ambassador to the UN in New York. We're very much looking forward for these constructive discussions. Yet, it, to us, it has always been clear that those discussions and agreements among states can only be part of the picture. We also need to think about how to bring the agreements between states to life. And we need to engage directly with those stakeholders that are driving forward the digital transformation. The private sector. This insight is also at the heart of our digital foreign policy strategy that we have developed last year. It recognizes digital governance as a transversal and interdis interdisciplinary topic that needs involvement of the private sector, civil society, as well as the technical and scientific community. And many of these stakeholders are already present in Geneva. Against this particular background, we have launched the Geneva Dialogue on Responsible Behavior in Cyberspace in 2020. It has brought together many important business players from all over the world to discuss and agree upon measures to improve the security of digital products. With fully virtual so far, the digital the dialogue has cherished the Geneva spirit of diversity, inclusivity, and trust building. We have put the security of digital products in focus as it addresses a topic that is directly relevant, relevant to the activity of our corporate partners while also providing a clear link to the negotiations at the UN level, where measures such as enhancing supply chain security and vulnerability disclosures are also being discussed. The Geneva Dialogue has already reached important milestones, such as an agreement upon definitions and best industry practices for enhanced product security. Together with our industry partners, we are also developing concrete recommendations on how to enhance the security of digital products in the framework of the Geneva Dialogue. What is more, the Geneva Dialogue has also reached out to regulators and standard organizations in order to align its work with the work of those important stakeholders. Emerging regulation on the security of digital products should be aligned or at least compatible and based on existing international standards. Our meeting today is part of those efforts to connect the dots and build bridges between the different stakeholders. And I'm happy that we can launch important research by the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich on regulatory approaches to the security of digital products today. Going forward, I want to see the Geneva Dialogue 
move even more down the road of developing actionable principles for the security of digital products and the prevention of our cyber of cyber incidents in keeping with the current trusted environment and the dynamics of the Geneva dialogue the discussion should be moved ever closer to action so that our common digital future will get more secure and peaceful and let me conclude and recap just you know that what is really important to us and why I think this Geneva Dialogue is such an important tool also for the future. It's very practical. We need to get from principles to practical, actionable um, uh, norms. And it has to be bottom up with mainly the industry uh, and, and other uh, civil society partners. And it has to be non-ideological, ideological, and uh, bridge building. And I think that is really the spirit we want to develop this dialogue. And it's also in that spirit that I'm looking forward now to the discussions in these sessions. Thank you very much, Lada. Back to you. Thank you, Ambassador. I think it was um, quite a, a, a good uh, view of how, um, I would say, technical issues connect to these political ones. There was something that was always confusing uh, ever since we started discussing uh, um, well, security of digital products and starting the G Geneva Dialogue it was a question why Swiss government and an NGO, which is Stiplor, educational NGO, and then a lot of industries and how does it all connect actually? <clears throat> and I think you, you managed to uh, shed light on, on uh, with one particular phrase that you said, <clears throat> the security of digital products is a precondition for many other things, including development, economic development, economic uh, relations, trade, security, and all that. And I think that's the, <clears throat> the bottom line. Um, one of the ideas in the next part is to actually listen to different perspectives. And we'll start with a, a, a keynote address, if I can call it that way, uh, a short view by, by the industry representative. It's a pleasure to welcome Alexei Kuznetsov, who is the head of security analysis at the uh, Bison, Bison uh, part of the uh, Sber group, uh, and who is hands-on uh, when it comes to security of digital products uh, uh, from various various angles. So, Alexei, welcome, and I pass the floor to you to guide us through the industry perspective. Uh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, uh, first of all, I need to share my screen. Uh, wait a second. Mm -hmm. So, I suppose uh, you see my screen, and it's okay. Yes. So nice. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, well, thank you for being here, uh, and thank the organizers for the, of the sessions for inviting me to take a part, part in this event. Uh, well, uh, um, as for me, I'm uh, head of uh, application security. Uh, previously, I did some, I was on the edge, I was a practical specialist, I did penetration testing, I uh, create and build a secure development lifecycle in the different organization. Uh, and uh, I would like uh, to share uh, my point of view and the point of view of, uh, I suppose, my organization and my um, department, which I'm leading. Uh, so, um, it's not a secret uh, for anybody that uh, digitalization is uh, gathering pace. Uh, almost every organization is undergoing extensive digital transformation. Um, this transformation is not on the paper nowadays. Uh, it's not like uh, it was five years ago when everyone just published things that they go to the digital transformation. It's uh, really in the real life nowadays. Uh, maybe it's a uh, coronavirus which uh, lead us to uh, to begin this uh, to, to do this faster. Maybe it's uh, other principles. Maybe it's just the time to do this uh, to do the digital transformation uh, in a rapid pace. Uh, so uh, almost every company is now create new applications. Uh, uh, it's uh, this application creates more IT and internet facing systems, uh, and uh, all of these uh, increase. Uh, uh, the presence of the organization in the internet, uh, so it uh, it uh, it creates the welfare actually for people. But uh, the other side that it's great, uh, it it creates wider cyber attack surface, so uh, cyber criminals can. Um, so it, it, as you know, it's uh, only one breach is enough to compromise the organization in most cases, uh, and uh, this application creates wider cyber attack surface. So. 
Mm. Uh, uh, furthermore, uh, IT infrastructure has become ever more code based. Uh, uh, I can even say that today the concept may be called everything as a code. So uh, if uh, five years ago, uh, system administration just uh, moving the servers from the room to room, uh, nowadays they code uh, the, the, infrastructure, the, the infrastructure. They create a network infrastructure structure by writing code. Uh, they create operation system setup. Uh, they do applications applications delivery to the production side. Uh, it's not it's now all, it's all now the code. Um, at the same time, uh, well, such transformation bring new risk. Uh, increasing interconnect uh, interconnectedness, uh, remote workplaces moving to cloud create more attack vectors for cyber criminals. Uh, the company's infrastructure is uh, expanding, uh, and uh, to ensure its stable growth and effective operation, it uh, really need to be protected and secure. Um, uh, so uh, cyber criminals uh, attack more day by day. We all hear it in the news, TV, podcasts, everywhere. Today, uh, there are many talks about uh, supply chain attacks, uh, web application hacking, uh, crypto stock exchange uh, hacking, uh, vulnerability exploitation uh, in the wild. Um, well, uh, cyber attacks uh, really becoming more sophisticated and grow in number. Uh, if uh, five years ago there was uh, phishing attacks, just phishing attacks, not ex no news about exploitation of the applications. Uh, but nowadays it's uh, just news about uh, about uh, exploitation of the vulnerabilities and crypt exchanges and other web, web applications which uh, hold uh, lots of information about people and a lot of PI, PII, sorry. Um, so once gathering access to company infrastructure, uh, actually hackers uh, well, might remain unnoticed for weeks within the company network perimeter. Uh, and to, it's not the matter of the it's not the matter of security maturity in these companies and organization. It's uh, just uh, it's really complicated task to to find them. Uh, well, uh, a study uh, by IBM this uh, this year study reveals that companies uh, require about two hundred days to find out uh, they have been hacked. Uh, together with the average 75 days uh, to contain the breach, uh, uh, its total life cycle might constitute about uh, 300 days. Um, uh, at the same time, um, at the same time, companies uh, face a real shortage of qualified IT and cybersecurity experts. Uh, the, in the industry nowadays grows uh, faster than uh, the specialists uh, grow up. <laughs> Uh, the speed of uh, digital transformation and lack of qualified personnel lead to the bugs and vulnerabilities in digital products. Uh, if a developer, for example, not experienced enough, uh, he will make um, uh, more mistakes in their code and create more vulnerabilities uh, in the products. Uh, our experience show that uh, hack, uh, uh, that for hackers, software vulnerabilities is one of the most popular uh, vectors of attack. Uh, in, in the same role with uh, management uh, interfaces hacking, it's just uh, uh, when when the interface is left by uh, left accidentally by the system administration the administrator, sorry, uh, uh, and with phishing attacks, uh, which is uh, nowadays uh, evolving into more, to more complicated thing, things that uh, not just uh, sending the the email. Um, uh, so uh, all the, all of these uh, all these software vulnerabilities uh, uh, brings us to, to a simple and uh, but but very important point. Uh, there is a need to secure the code. Uh, the sooner a bug or vulnerability in the code is fixed, uh, the lower the cost. Uh, if you notice a bug uh, on the stage of application design, uh, it will take less time to fix it, and uh, so cost less money. Uh, if you notice it uh, on the development or production stage, it will reasonably, reasonably uh, cost you more. Uh, if, it is, if it's exploited by an attacker, it may uh, entail, uh, entail huge financial and reputational losses. Uh, and what is worse, uh, people will suffer too. Uh, well, I remember an, it, an incident uh, in my experience. Uh, attackers uh, have stolen a database with about uh, 10 million uh, active phone numbers. And uh, for the next few years, 
Uh, they use it to perform phishing attacks, uh, just phishing attacks on people uh, who own these uh, telephone numbers. Uh, so the uh, consequences of this uh, in, uh, of this incident not only the uh, harm to the organization but uh, to uh, to people. It's uh, it's a lot of it, it's it's really worse. So. Um, uh, so actually, uh, to build uh, the cost-efficient security system, you should uh, first introduce a security control on the early stage of software development. Uh, and uh, actually, there is a quite a simple approach here. Uh, this, uh, some control should be implemented to create success, successful software security program. Uh, well, it's uh, threat modeling uh, on the design stage. You should know your adversary. You should know your threats. It's a uh, technical control such as static and dynamic analysis of the application, uh, such as dependency checking and other other things. Uh, it's uh, another thing is a third party control. Uh, it's a code you use uh, from other organization. Uh, you should also use. Uh, you should also do some subcontractor audit. Uh, the one of the most part, uh, in my opinion, is uh, education and culture. Uh, personnel should be aware about threats and uh, cybersecurity trends and vulnerabilities in their application. Um, metrics and monitoring. Uh, monitoring is also is also important because uh, any successful program should be regularly assessed. Uh, and the independent audit, you should. Uh, it's real. It's it's also important because you should. Uh, um, you should see your infrastructure from other side. You should also uh, you should always uh, see it from the from the independent side, the independent view. Uh, so during the last uh, last years, uh, there are a few methodologies appeared from uh, commerce uh, commercial organization and and community group, uh, such as uh, synopsis. If we take uh, commercial organization, we will talk about the scene uh, and uh, Avasp. Uh, for five, for ten years, or so maybe fifteen years, is the headliner of the security uh, security methodologies. Um, there are a few recommendations on the government level, but uh, is my, in my opinion, they are not much for enough. Uh, there is a lot of growth to do, uh, that a lot of things to do. Uh, well, that's really sad as for me because nowadays every function of our life is digitalized, and all people want to feel more secure. Uh, um, well, I would like to highlight uh, two big, big challenges uh, that we face in software security. Uh, one of these is lack of transparency. Uh, another is lack of standards in this area. Uh, so imagine a tech company producing uh, some software digital products. Uh, it de uh, its developers uh, create a software library, for example, uh, to use in company products, but also they publish it uh, as an open source for public use. Uh, and then someone, during an audit or accidentally find the critical vulnerabilities in this code. Uh, well, sure, the company will try to fix it uh, as soon as possible uh, and uh, even release a patch, maybe mitigate the vulnerability and, uh, and uh, publish this patch uh, in the open source. But uh, uh, they may be already hundreds of other products using this company. Oh, this lab, uh, I'm sorry, this library. Uh, Many of them of them will not update uh, this library due to compatibility issues. Other won't update, uh, uh, doesn't update. They don't update the dependencies at all. Uh, so they software will uh, will be vulnerable for all this time. Uh, and actually, who is responsible for that? Uh, some companies, uh, to to acknowledge uh, uh, other people who use their courts, publish security bulletins. But uh, in most cases, uh, there, are, there is information and consistency in it. Uh, so it, it, when you read it, you don't know how to check if your software was hacked or not. Uh, the other side on, of, the, of the coin, uh, of the coin in these bulletins is that if you publish too much information about vulnerability, um, uh, it can be used by hackers to replay the attack and compromise uh, the products. Um, oops, sorry. Um, nowadays, uh, if a vulnerability or incident is revealed, you can see a reaction of society. Uh, well, for example, when some vulnerability in the software companies was found, stocks are dropping, uh, government begins investigation, business suffer from it. 
uh, well, uh, uh, I would like to say that it's normal to find vulnerabilities in the digital products, and it's normal that uh, they are in digital products, uh, and it's normal to publish it. It, mean, it means progress and growth. Uh, but what is crucial is to achieve transparency, develop cooperation, uh, and elaborate a responsible approach to vulnerabilities and digital product security from vendors, developers, infrastructure providers, governments, and all of the stakeholders and all the participants uh, and uh, users of this product. Uh, the topic is indeed very complicated. It will take a lot, more, a lot of more time to discuss it. Uh, but uh, well, I expect a really a very interesting discussion further so thank you very much uh that's all what i want to say thank you thank you alexei i think it was uh, a little bit frightening uh but uh, but the reality as you mentioned and one thing stuck to my mind when you mentioned that uh, all has everything has become a code uh, that's something that in geneva that i'm discussing how to define digital products uh and trying to find the characteristics of of digital products besides interconnectivity or ability to interconnect code was one of those issues which was just unique to all these smart connected devices software hardware and everything that works together and uh, the, the the challenges that you explain when it comes to building up a secure code and of course not just the code but the code uh, particularly uh, related to the complexity to outsourcing to uh, open source to lack of capacities uh, and expertise, and I think that's an, an important issue that you mentioned, um, that developers are not necessarily security professionals, they're not necessarily trained for security, we need more people that actually understand both. Um, and uh, now what, what uh, I take from, from your comment, which is directly in this discussion, uh, related to responsibilities and um, the, 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 the existing controls in a way, you mentioned that uh, in technical terms, uh, or if we wish in industry terms, there are a number of methodologies and uh, security controls, and you mentioned some of them, which can be used. The question is to what extent, of course, the industry use them uh, and which types of industry. Hmm. Um, and you also mentioned that, uh, uh, or invited in a way that we need more on a government level, or let's say regulatory levels and so on. And I think that, and also the standards, but we'll reflect on that later a little bit more. Uh, so in a nutshell, the topic is really complex and we need all of those actors together, right? Uh, yeah. But okay, we'll, we'll, try to, we'll try to bring some more meat into this discussion uh, now. Uh, okay, Alexis, stay with us. Uh, if there is okay. any, uh, any burning comment or question, uh, let me know. Uh, and certainly please share in the chat uh, and share your thoughts, not necessarily just the questions that we can develop discussion in, in chat. There are also a couple of comments already. Uh, with that, I'll move now to uh, a very connected part, which was raised by Alexei in a way, uh, and that is uh, related to the regulatory frameworks. Uh, so where are we when it comes to regulatory frameworks? Uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce and invite uh, Neil Aachen, who is a senior researcher for cybersecurity and foreign policy at the ETHZ Center for Security Studies. What Nila did was uh, a research throughout this year uh, under the umbrella of Geneva Dialogue, trying to map what are these governance or regulatory approaches when it comes to security of digital products. And um, I guess it's quite complex, Nila, the results. So I leave it to you now, Nila. Yes, thank you, Vladar. Um, yes, it's quite complex. And, and I'm coming to this topic now from a more legal and policy perspective. So now when I speak about governance approaches, um, I try to look at, at legal and policy instruments in a number of jurisdictions. And I talked to um, public officials in seven different jurisdictions for the report. Um, and right now, I would like just to give a, a, an overview um, about some key findings in the report. I will try to keep it as short as possible so that we have enough time um, to discuss some of the open questions. Um, uh, let me... There we go. So um, I would like to share three main key insights. The first one is that I think digital products is still a relatively new field of governance and regulation. Uh, some of you might be surprised because um, they are already dealing with this issue for a longer time, but maybe this is also more from a technical side and less from a regulatory and policy side. So I would argue that, that the um, 
governance on, of digital product security is rather new and started in 2018 or around 2017 or 18. And the second point is, is that the term digital product is not used in regulatory instruments or guidelines on the operational level. And the third point, um, which is interesting to see, is that industry is actually not against mandatory security requirements, but the main question is how are we um, determining, determining these requirements and how are we trying to achieve better security of digital products? Um, and that one main issue and concern of industry that was also raised within the Geneva Dialogue is the question of harmonization and that there need, be, need to be better transnational re recognition of certifications. So let me start with the first point um, that digital products is a new field of um, governance and regulation. And this was this brings me back actually to, to discussions that I had together with Vlada and Jonas when I just started to write the report. And I, I always ask, ask them, what do you mean by digital products? Because I was really struggling to find um, the term digital products in the legal instruments that I was familiar with. And so um, I would like to lead you a bit through the process that I have done uh, while I was writing the report. And I think lawyers or policymakers often distinguish between three different fields. The first one is the security of personal data. So everything that we know around data protection and most data protection regimes have provisions that relate to data security. And this actually dates back internationally quite some time. So the first time that the principle of data security was acknowledged is in the 1980s by the OECD privacy principles. And then the second um, regulatory area or governance area is the protection of critical infrastructure, which most of you are probably familiar with as well. And this is an area that came almost 20 years later um, it raised, it gained more importance um, when President Clinton in the US established a commission on the protection of critical infrastructure. And since then, it's, it's almost an established element of international policy debates. And I think now we have this new um, area, which is security of digital products. It's reflected in national policies, but also on the international level. Um, and of course, now you might wonder, okay, isn't there an overlap? Can you always clearly distinguish between these different areas? Um, that's difficult uh, for sure. I think there's an overlap between um, data security and security of digital products in the sense that both areas are protecting individuals. Um, but the distinction is that security of digital products protects consumer more as a group and doesn't necessarily establish individual rights. So that's the distinction between these two areas. And then between protection of critical infrastructure and security of digital products, I think we haven't figured it out yet or national public policymakers haven't figured it out yet. There's an overlap between both areas. There's a tendency that in general protection of critical infrastructure is concerned about um, security measures of the organization and the entity and the security of digital products relates more to the development process of the digital product. But there is an overlap in two ways. One is because cloud services, there's some certain products such as cloud services that are sometimes considered now to be critical infrastructure, but at the same time, they are also a digital product. That's one overlap. And then the second overlap is that there are some um, efforts, national regulatory efforts now to regulate digital products that are used by critical infrastructure providers. Um, and there is a lot of discussion and it's, it's evolving. Uh, one example is um, the German IT law that um, um, defines critical components of critical infrastructure, which is basically some types of digital products that are used uh, within the critical infrastructure. So why a new field of regulation? As it's very much linked to um, major cyber attacks that we have seen in the past related to supply chain. And the idea is that everything is connected and that, that we actually have, um, we cannot distinguish necessarily anymore between the, the need to protect critical infrastructure and other businesses. Because if a digital product is used by a wide um, variety of, of businesses, then we need to improve the security of the products um, to really improve security and overall for all society, for all businesses um, and for consumers. Um, 
to the second point um, that the term digital product is not used in regulatory instruments or guidelines on an operational level, this was very challenging to find out because um, I, I think on an international level, it's almost used as normal. Okay, we speak about digital products and there is a benefit to it. It's actually useful because it gives us a framing about what we are speaking opposed to the, opposed to the other two areas that I just mentioned. Um, and there are also in, actually legal instruments that use the term digital product. There was an executive order recently in the US that makes reference to um, ICT products and services. There's the EU cybersecurity certification framework, which also makes reference to this. But we could categorize these types of instruments more as instruments that mandate a public agency um, now to do something more concrete. And I distinguish these instruments from instruments more on an operational level. And what I mean by this is instruments that are clearly defining objectives, security objectives, and measures how to achieve these objectives. And when we come to this level of guidelines um, or public policy instruments or legal documents, um, then actually the term digital product is not used anymore. Um, but they public these documents rather refer to specific types of technologies, such as AI, cloud services, or one of the most um, developed areas is actually the area of consumer IoT devices. Um, there were some exceptions. Um, one exception is that there are certain horizontal aspects that I, how I call them, that are relevant for all types of digital products. Um, and one example is supply chain, which we might hear later about as well, which were also discussed in a working group of the Paris call. Um, there are a lot of discussions now about software bills of materials, and these are areas that we could consider are relevant for all types of digital products. And then another exception is more threat focused uh, documents. And for me, ransomware is one of the most prominent exam examples right now. Um, we could link this to the uh, ransomware um, task force initiative, which, was, which is led by the US right now. And many countries um, are engaged in this initiative. To the third point, um, that industry is not against mandatory security requirements. I think that's really important. And I think there's um, in the debates, there's a lot of discussion always about mandatory versus voluntary. Is there fear? Should we just stay with voluntary requirements? But in my discussions, I really found that this is not the key aspect. And I really don't think that public policymakers are mainly concerned with this because it's more the second step, okay, what, how do we regulate it? Um, because you can have mandatory requirements, which are fairly basic, baseline requirements, fairly prescriptive, such as just saying, okay, IoT devices, uh, there shouldn't be a default password. Probably everyone would be pretty okay with this. And, and it's not such big interference into, into global um, commerce either. So I think the question that we need to ask is whether how to do it. And there are a couple of challenges related to this. Um, so I don't want to get into too much details to this right now, but some of the issues that, that are in keeping policymakers up at night is more, how do they make developers care about um, regulation or standards um, and there are different types how to do it and we can rather use broad terms such as security by design or developing more prescriptive baseline requirements which was probably targeting different types of um, developers in different in different companies the different sizes of companies um, and then that another question how to adapt to quick to the quick changes of technology because the cycle of developing a law regulation or standard is much longer than the development of the technology. And, and another issue is whether cybersecurity requirements should be developed on horizontal aspects that address all types of digital products or whether we should continue to develop standards and, and, and objectives for each type of technology different. Um, I think it's important to distinguish in this area um, the different degrees of harmonization. So as I say, industry is not against um, these requirements, but there's a lot of concern that there are different developments in different jurisdictions and that it's getting very complex um, to actually comply with all requirements in particular um, if these requirements are getting mandatory and, and so much for different types of products. And what I, so usually um, digital products 
the governance can be distinguished between three different elements. There's standards and then certification, which is something that is regulated on a national level, and then labels. And there is much more uh, coordination on the level of standardization than on the other two levels. Um, certification is still very much on a bilateral level um, that countries recognize the certification in one country um, from one country in another country. Um, and labels, there is efforts. Um, there are certain states who have advanced a lot on this issue and who try to promote their approach to labels. But they, there's no real effort to develop a, a global type of, of label, uh, which I think is also fair enough. Maybe we don't need it because maybe a label should be targeted to a specific market. It's in a different language. Uh, different consumers have different expectations. But the issue is really about certification and how to better harmonize this. So this brings me to some open questions that I think might be interesting to discuss uh, in the follow-up discussion. Uh, the first one is which actors are best capable to advance policies in which kind of area where we can probably distinguish between standards and certification. And then um, the second area that I, I think is interesting as well, whether we are capable or whether it's actually possible to develop policies that are applicable for all types of digital products. And then this is opposed to maybe if we talk about standards, we have to distinguish between different products. But is it possible to, um, as um, Ambassador Wexler um, called it, this, um, um, where was it, this actionable principles, whether these actionable principles can still stay at this high level of digital products. Um, and one very final thought is about um, who should be involved on a global scale. This is just um, um, a figure that is also, uh, that I go more into detail in the report. Uh, it was actually a real challenge to get involved all different jurisdictions um, in my report and in my research. I'm not sure why and where it comes from, whether the term digital product is used only in certain countries and not in others, or whether actually it's geopolitical issues behind it. And I think that's an important issue because I completely agree that one of the advantages of the Geneva Dialogue is that it should be non-ideological, as Ambassador Baxler also said. Um, but in practice, it's a challenge because um, it's just not existing, this like, dialogue even on this level uh, where we could think okay now we could discuss and we should discuss around across all jurisdictions um, it remains a challenge to really get involved everyone thank you very much thanks Nila uh, and uh, by the way uh, we have the link in the chat for uh, to the full report so anyone who's interested uh, just uh, go through and read and send us your comments uh, and I I got the note of something very similar that, that Alexei said was it's uh, that you also said it's getting complex. So, you know, it's complex from the technical point of view. It's also complex from the legal and regulatory point of view. Uh, and, and you mentioned a couple of, I think, important bits. Um, uh, one is the framing uh, that you that you discussed. So th there is a different framing or different understanding uh, by regulators among themselves, how they approach it, whether it's through the critical infrastructure, supply chain, data security, IoT security, and all that you mentioned, which is again different from the framing that maybe the technical community has and the standards have, our standards community. Uh, then uh, you mentioned this uh, uh, turning digital products or using digital products within the critical infrastructure. And that is something that, that is becoming typical because the vendors do not necessarily know how the product, be it the software or IoT will end and how it's gonna be used. And when it is used in a critical infrastructure, it becomes in a way critical. So I think this point on can we actually distinguish or mark or define what are the critical uh, products or products that could get critical is, is, is really a, a big deal. You mentioned the German case, the US had this, this uh, executive order calling for trying to define what, are, what is critical software. So we might see that more and more. Uh, and then, uh, as you mentioned, I think this is the, the key question. Uh, whether we can actually deal with security of digital products uh, on a global level and where. Uh, not necessarily just within the legal framework and regulatory, as you mentioned, but also technical and standards and all that. So what are the issues that we can settle on a global level and where we might be really happy and it's maybe even better to have on a local level? Um, I'm opening the floor now for any uh, comments and requests. And um, 
questions. We have about maybe 10 minutes for, for discussion on this. And while I'm waiting for, for, for the hands up, I want to call on because I, I know with us, we have uh, uh, some, some people that can shed light from different perspectives. Uh, and I think Bilal uh, Yamusi uh, from the ITU is here with us, Bilal. Uh, well, you should be somewhere in Dubai, I think, or, or else, uh, but still with us online. If you're here, can you pick up the mic and uh, just reflect on all of this from the standardization perspective? Let me see if Bilal is uh, available to pick the mic. Else, we'll wait for Bilal and bring him a little bit later. Uh, but then let me invite um, Edwin Sin from the Singapore Cybersecurity uh, Authority. Uh, and I think, uh, Nila, you mentioned Singapore is one of the examples as of uh, labeling schemes. So, uh, Edwin, any, any reflections from the regulatory point of view, particularly from the, from the state which is very, very advanced in, in this field, Edwin? Thank you. Uh, this is a very good question, and um, I would be very pleased to share Singapore's perspective on the use of uh, uh, labeling schemes uh, to enhance security in digital products, um, and perhaps to share some uh, experiences from the operational of the cybersecurity labeling scheme as an example to share our policy approach and what are some of the considerations that we thought of and have actually implemented to strengthen security in consumer IoT products. Well, uh, we always know that the speed of technology adoption. Um, has already, you know, accelerated for both work and play, and there is a great demand for high quality and secure products. So uh, at present, the CSA, the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore, they, they we have operate three schemes, um, the Common Criteria Scheme, the National IT Evaluation Scheme, and also the Cybersecurity Labeling Scheme. And of course, this uh, Cybersecurity Labeling Scheme was launched back in October last year, and it really targets consumer IoT smart devices. So these schemes actually work by uh, providing cost transparency and branding for these digital products and uh, offer security assurance either by through uh, validated self-declarations and testing of these IT or IoT devices under third-party independent test laboratories. Um, they cater for different security needs of different users. So um, back then, there wasn't such a scheme available for consumer IoT products. And with the increasing security threat from the large number of IoT devices, so um, back in October last year, we launched a labeling scheme, which is a voluntary multi-level scheme offering uh, resistance against common cyber attacks. Now, one of the considerations that we had was whether for this labeling scheme, uh, we had multiple considerations. Firstly, should it be voluntary or mandatory, uh, which is also a key point that is uh, highlighted by many. Um, for us, uh, we designed the scheme to adopt a hybrid approach, in which is actually primarily voluntary, but mandated for certain categories. Uh, we have the view that we want to take approach that we want to incentivize the market to use cybersecurity as a differentiator among their competitors. Uh, furthermore, Singapore is a very small market uh, and we don't want, want to suddenly you know, cause a shortage of IoT devices in Singapore by making it mandatory. And more, so hence for, for Wi-Fi routers, uh, which we deem are more critical because it's the only device sitting between the home network and the internet. Uh, we work with our telco regulator to sort of uh, require that new Wi-Fi routers uh, must have minimally size level one by May of next year before they can be put on sale in the Singapore market. So this is a sort of the hybrid approach that we are taking. Um, mandatory for Wi-Fi routers, which are more critical, and then a voluntary basis for other types of consumer IoT devices like your IP cameras, door locks, etc. Now, the other consideration that we had is um, where, whether this scheme should be a single level or multiple levels. Um, we realized that uh, manufacturers, they, uh, they have different level of resources and capabilities. Uh, some are SMEs or larger companies, and consumers may also have different needs and risk appetites. They may not all want the highest security level for all their IT products. And hence, we designed the CLS to be multi-level. So um, this could actually address the different range of manufacturers and consumer needs. So therefore, um, through the multiple levels, we hope to actually incentivize manufacturers um, over time to gradually uh, motivate them towards higher uh, security levels by developing more and more secure products. So for example, um, we have met many small manufacturers who are unable to meet even the level one requirements. And of course, they, for, for a start, they can first choose to go for level one and afterward try to level themselves up towards higher level afterwards. And since level one and two are premised upon uh, valid self declarations, it remains very low cost and it's very fast and easy to achieve. Uh, and even at level one, we realize um, some of them, um, once they actually uh, meet these requirements, 
it will really eradicate most of the most common IoT problem of having universal default passwords, uh, not having a vulnerability disclosure policy, and not having software updates. So already at level one, this solves a lot of the problems for us in general. And for larger, more established manufacturers, um, maybe you can talk about the big name, big name brands like Google or Asus. Um, then of course they can, uh, they are already very proficient in this field and they can just straight away go for the highest CIS levels, level three or four. And uh, this will ensure that um, the routers or the devices themselves have no known software common vulnerabilities um, and that they have a secure software supply chain, they practice secure by design principles and uh, they are resistant against common cyber attacks. So this multi-level approach actually enables them to stand out in the market and this is sort of the approach that we want to take. Um, Firstly, the label will provide branding for manufacturers. And secondly, from the consumer perspective, we want to actually you know, make them more security conscious. We want to change their mindset um, to enable them through these labels to differentiate the more secure devices among the less secure ones. And hopefully in the future, they will start to demand for more cyber secure products in the future and to only want to choose to buy and use secure ones. Um, on the part of fragmentation and international call of collaboration, um, mutual recognition has always been a key consideration right from the start when we actually designed the scheme. Um, Singapore is a small country and although we are ambitious, uh, we cannot tackle the IoT security problem alone. And it is not, IoT is not just a personal consumer uh, security problem anymore, but rather also one of national security, given past incidents like Mirai, which took down quite a number of key systems and we do not want a repeat of the same incidents on CII infrastructures as well. Um, hence, among the many standards, one of the approach that we took was to adopt the SCN3036.5 standard, which is increasingly adopted by many other nations as well. And we think that doing so would actually aid us in achieving mutual recognition of the labeling scheme with other nations. And indeed, this has uh, worked well. Uh, with Singapore, actually, we are very pleased to share that we have uh, established mutual recognition with Finland scheme at the Singapore National International Cyber Week just a few months back. Um, this is a very important factor because for manufacturers who have voiced similar sentiment in wanting more mutual recognition, uh, it's crucial that we strive towards doing so um, to improve market access and reduce duplicator testing for manufacturers such that their efforts can be better placed towards um, developing more secure products. We do not want them to be doing repeated testing across different nations, among different jurisdictions, and, and of course, certification schemes. Um, of course, uh, we understand that um, different nations may choose to adopt different standards, uh, but we could see where we are similar in terms of technical requirements and work out how we could have mutual recognition from there. Um, I like to think that although we do have certain different views on certain aspects, perhaps on how we work certain requirements or what we want to see, um, I like to think for the large part, we are quite similar in terms of what we want for security in IoT devices. Uh, we want them to have baseline security requirements. We want them to practice security by design and resistance against you no know, common cyber attacks. So there are, we do notice that there are a lot of like-minded countries doing looking at this. And all of us think that IoT security is important and that we should do something about it. And in this aspect, this is something that I certainly hope to see more collaboration in harmonization efforts and mutual recognition aspects. Thank you, Edwin. I think this was this was very useful, not just your tiered system and this hybrid approach of mix of voluntary and mandatory measures, but the, the recognition that, that you can't do alone, not only because, okay, Singapore is a small country, but generally we can't fight the, the, the security of the whole environment on, on our own. Uh, and that maybe the standards are this uh, cornerstone and we've discussed a lot in Geneva Dialogue on some baseline requirements that go beyond standards because standards are one component of that. But let's let's open the floor. Um, and I see Anastasia's hand, but before that, I wanted to check if there is anyone in Katowice who actually wants to reflect and take the floor. Uh, we see you as, as small uh, heads over there, so I'm not sure if there is anyone who wants to pick the mic, just raise the hand and or wave a little bit and then we'll see you. The camera is on you anyhow, so uh, we, can, we can see. Uh, if there is no one, uh, just, Make sure that you that you wave and we'll, we'll take the mic and we'll get you the floor. Give it the floor, um, Nastya. Thank you very much, and again, congratulations to Neda for really a good good overview and a good actually highlighting the urgent questions that I think um, many actors, both on the public and the private side, trying to conceptualize these days. Um, I just wanted to share the remarks to the 
both questions that Anel raised. Uh, first, if it's possible to define sort of the overreaching principles, if I understood the questions um, correctly, then I assume that the OECD, I think this is the right place for doing so, at least for the OECD member states. Um, those uh, pre reports in 2021 provide the six high level recommendations to the OECD member states, how really at a high level to regulate the security of digital products. Um, and maybe with the updating those recommendations, we would see more specific um, layered approach, what different actors, code owners, those who could be really helpful in mitigating vulnerabilities, those who actually have in further roles, what they could do for that to implement those high level principles. Um, but of course, not all countries are part of the OECD and not all of the companies and not all of the businesses industry that are really important to ensure the security of digital products know about the OECD. So I think it's still an open question if it's possible to somehow make sure that those at least good practices that OECD helps to conceptualize could be somewhere taken uh, for the consideration in other countries. Um, and I would speak here about the Russia, for, in for instance, which is not a part of OECD, but there, of course, there's a lot of discussions of uh, also how to regulate IoT, how to regulate overall the critical software. Another remark very short about the um, the critical components within the critical infrastructure. And I think it's really interesting trend, if I even may say so, um, that maybe some governments may like to see not broadly about the critical functions, but going into more component level. What are those particular products, services can become really vital and critical in which use cases, under which conditions and in, in which critical functions. So I think it's really in a good, more detailed mapping exercise to thus define um, what's really needed to be critical, because obviously um, I think everything cannot be critical. We need to have different um, layered approach uh, because I think our resource is also limited and we need to understand what's to prioritize uh, in event of the cyber incident. Thank you. Thank you, Nasty. I think this, this point on, on uh, finding the critical functions of, of the products is, is, is uh, a very good one. Uh, so we can probably elaborate on, on that more. Uh, I don't know if we have anyone from the OECD here, uh, but since you already, in a way, opened the second part of discussion, which I think is, is uh, precious, is where or who can help more in this, uh, let's say, coordination of connecting the dots. Uh, maybe, Nastya, since you already had the mic, you can just let us know you were coordinating the Paris Call uh, Working Group 6 on supply chain. And supply chain is another sort of a framing of this of this discussion. Do you want to briefly reflect on what could be, what was the role of the Paris Call and what could be the role uh, when it comes to continuation of this dialogue? Sure, absolutely, with pleasure. Um, we work within the Paris Call, Paris Call, who may not even know, this is the multi stakeholder initiative of the French government. It unites lots of the different organizations coming with from different backgrounds, and they announced different working groups, and within working group six, we specifically wanted to to answer the key question, where are the policy gaps to regulate IT supply chain security across different jurisdictions? Um, we were pretty well much uh, aware of that we're not really the government body, we're not really having any mandate to, um, to say what in terms of the security measure should or should not be implemented. But we wanted us to raise great awareness and help many, especially small and medium organizations that need to tackle with this issue, obviously because um, it was quite good uh, said that with relying on software, everything becomes a software issue and um, where every organization actually relies on the software and more digital products, every organization needs to deal with this software related um, challenges, not only those who develop software. So we produced the report, which I think at a high level level, which was our goal, maps the key frameworks and using again the OECD approach, we highlighted where are those policy gaps still, which many of those frameworks are not really sufficiently covering. And maybe this could be the areas where already next year, we all together may focus more and specifically be more practical here. One of the areas we identified was the um, creating market incentives. 
um, not only for those who develop software, but only for those who actually need to be compliant and to be as a part of the supply chains to ensure lots of the processes. Again, keeping in mind that not all of, all of them have the resources for that. And also we wanted to be more pragmatic and practical here and try to build the metrics showcasing where different actors, including governments and international standardization bodies can have roles already today, can have uh, can take pragmatic actions already today to make the contributions to create a more positive security impact through the supply chains. Um, I will be happy to share in the link, but also um, would be really happy to hear any critical remarks and maybe Neil, um, answering to your question, maybe you um, would disagree with me that I, I, I mentioned about the OECD. Thank you. Thanks, Nastya. Uh, any any other comments? Uh, just raise a hand. I know there is quite some bits on uh, ISO standards discussion in the chat. Uh, it would be interesting if anyone of you, uh, uh, Edward or, or uh, Michael or anyone wants to jump in and reflect on the role of the, the standardization organizations in this in pulling up this communication uh, and coordination when it comes to uh, security of digital products, particularly, so not as broad as ISO 27.1, but, uh, but uh, more narrowly, maybe. Uh, just let me know or just jump in if you wish. Um, I just raise a hand as you wish. Uh, in the meantime, if no interest from that side, let me see if, uh, if uh, Kaya, you're, you're around. I think uh, you can actually connect uh, not only from Paris call aspect as, as a Microsoft representative, but also on um, uh, uh, cybersecurity tech accord and as, as another venue where these discussions and principles are being set. And certainly, Kai, feel free to reflect on the Microsoft for the industry perspective when any of the of the issues we raised thus far. Kai. Uh, thank you. No, yeah, I think the the that's the bit that is I think really interesting about the Geneva dialogue. And I think the the unique in the way it's been organized, sort of creating the links between the the the, the sort of the normative international discussions that governments are having um, at the UN and to an extent within the Paris call and then um, figuring out how you, these really high level agreements which are kind of like how do you protect critical infrastructure or on obligation to protect critical infrastructure gets in fact implemented on um, on a national basis. And I think, um, and, and, and at that point, you know, you have to talk about regulations and you have to talk about standards as we were just, and risk management approaches as, as kind of the conversation so far has been happening. And the the Paris Peace Call, call um, is, it sort of combines the two approaches, bringing together uh, the, the multi-stakeholder community um, um, underneath the different working groups. For instance, the one that Nastia was talking about, I think there was another one that looked more specifically on sort of the UN dialogues. There's another one that looked at broader norm implementation. And I think these are very helpful uh, venues for, uh, for like, informal conversations to be taking place ahead or that are able to then be inputted into sort of national approaches or even the OECD type of approaches on a more regional basis. And the cybersecurity tech accord <coughs> that the uh, Microsoft one of the members of um, is, a, is just um, over 150 companies similarly look at the different areas uh, in this space. They are collected around four but basically principles that guide the, the group's engagement. One is ensuring that we actually coordinate on things because it's good for cybersecurity. One is ensuring on, and that we uh, contribute to and invest in cybersecurity capacity building, whether it's government one, whether it's uh, more technical skills. Um, another one is uh, prioritizing defense. So um, ensuring that the, <laughs> the the, the products and services that we put forward are as secure as possible. And this is where recommendations such as the, the ones that are coming out of the Geneva Dialogue are very helpful. I think in particularly, particular for a lot of the smaller companies, they don't necessarily have the resources to figure a lot of these things out by themselves. Um, and then the, the, 
the, the, the last principle is sort of the commitment to not engaging in cyber offense. So uh, attacking effectively. Um, but yeah, no, that, that's kind of it. Thanks, Kai. And it again uh, emphasizes how broad this discussion is because it gets connected to uh, everything from uh, critical infrastructure to actually cyber conflict or stability, if you, if you wish, that you, that you mentioned. Um, let me pass the floor to Edward. In the meantime, I'm, I'm uh, inviting anyone else to raise a hand and jump in, including in the room. I'm trying to see, but you're still small. But if anyone wants, just raise a hand. Uh, Edward, the uh, floor is yours. And uh, thank you, Vladimir. Um, I just want to say a few words. Um, I uh, I belong to a, a group in ISO. In fact, there's been lots of chat going through on the 27,000 uh, series of standards. Uh, I'm the chair of the group that deals with all those standards. But I belong to a much bigger community a committee where we have three basic areas of standardization. One is management, and that's where 27001 fits in. We also have product standards, for example, dealing with IoT security and privacy. We also have uh, 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 standards looking at AI security and privacy. Uh, and then we have another group of standards dealing with uh, services, various uh, forms of service, and um, for example, cloud services and other uh, commercial services. Uh, overall, uh, we, we, we've got something like about 200 plus standards. Uh, some of them are particularly relevant to the discussion here today. If I just say something briefly about 27001, 27001 is a management uh, system standard. That's a special category of standards in ISO, and those standards can be certified. Um, <clears throat> there are mutual recognition agreements, international mutual recognition agreements, uh, which are developed by an organization called the International Accreditation Forum. And the members of that are all the um, accreditation bodies that are supported by governments all over the world. So <clears throat> 27001 is a standard that has mutual recognition agreements, so cert certificates are recognized uh, in, in different parts of the world. The standard itself is a management system standard, but it does cover uh, a broad uh, spectrum of, of requirements, both management and technical. Um, so that's just an, an illustration where we do deal directly with certification and we deal do we deal directly with mutual recognition <clears throat> we have another uh, group that deals with the evaluation security evaluation of products uh, and again there are mutual recognition uh, agreements uh, formed by various uh, countries uh, with regard to different security products whether it's from cards uh, through to uh, IoT and A AI. So we do have um, um, a wealth of standards. We do have a lot of activity uh, <clears throat> in our committee related to how do these uh, products, services, and systems get tested, verified, validated, and certified. So um, if anybody's interested, uh, then, I mean, I could go on for the whole of the day telling you about our committee, but I'm not going to. Um, so we are trying to contribute to um, not only a, a safer, secure, but more privacy oriented world. Um, so that's uh, enough of me. So anybody's got any questions, please ask. Thanks, Edward. And before pa passing the floor to Nila, I actually want to uh, keep the mic with you with one, one question we had uh, throughout discussions in Geneva Dialogue, and I, I guess broadly, and we mentioned it today. Uh, so if, if we have more and more critical products or products which can become critical, and they include code, they include uh, IoT devices, something that may be produced, libraries that I think Alexei mentioned at the beginning, uh, those are uh, increasingly produced by open source communities, by uh, startups, by, uh, I don't know, small, medium enterprises, which have very limited often awareness and resources and funds 
to um, get accredited with, uh, with the ISO, certificate, certified with ISO, pay for the standards, and even get involved in the processes like, like ISO does. Uh, how do you see, uh, is, is the ISO a place that could possibly involve more of, more of those um, different new emerging critical actors, if you wish, uh, and, and make these standards more accessible, more agile, more, I don't know, any reflections in that, in that regard? Um, from the point of view of who gets involved in standardization, we have, uh, which you probably all know, um, national member bodies. These are the standards committees in every country. Uh, in addition to that, we do have a number of liaisons uh, and these liaisons go out uh, to uh, industry groups, business groups. We've also got small to medium sized enterprise groups that we engage with. Um, and they also contribute to our development of standards and the discussion that we have in our meetings. So uh, we have got that sort of mechanism in place. So we do listen to, um, <clears throat> as I say, different industry groups. We don't do it right down to the individual industry, um, an individual organization. Uh, they would either need to do it through one of these industry groups, industry associations, or they would need, it, need to do it through their own national standards body. But we do listen and we do take uh, into account many of those contributions uh, that we get. Because, uh, to be perfectly honest, the, the standards are only as good as the input that we get. Uh, and as we, ISO works on the principle of consensus. So we do need consensus from all the uh, uh, contributors. And the more contributors we get, uh, the better we can uh, have a, a more accurate view of, of what is needed uh, in the market. Uh, and also um, accept that we do need a consensus. And this is an international consensus. Um, so that's, I think that answers or tries to answer your first question. But the second question is a little bit more difficult for me to answer, uh, answer because uh, the cost of standards, uh, et cetera, um, is, is a question for ISO itself. Uh, I, I don't work for ISO, I just chair an ISO group. Um, there are some standards that are publicly available. There is a, uh, on the ISO website, we do make some of these standards uh, free uh, to uh, anyone that wants to have access to them. But of course, this doesn't go for all standards and um, all the other types of standards that are not free, there it comes with a charge. So, um, but I can't really answer for ISO on their commercial uh, policy here. I, I just, I just know that some are free and some are not. I don't know whether that answers your question. Probably not completely. Well, not completely, but but that's uh, that's definitely a, a useful useful bit. Uh, what I what I read from this is that uh, the level of readiness of ISO to listen uh, to to other stakeholders now needs maybe a push to get those others to speak and basically connect somehow those that may not be that present in ISO surrounding in a way. Um, and that includes, or, or probably the role of, uh, or the power of uh, uh, other venues like Charter of Trust, uh, Cybersecurity Tech Accords, Geneva Dialogue, and many others, Paris Core, uh, could be coupled together with, what, uh, with the work of standardization organizations to try to get all those different actors, including the regulators, I think, uh, uh, together more and more. Uh, and by the way, we, we did have in Geneva Dialogue, there was an, uh, uh, an online event in May, uh, which was discussing particularly challenges related to standards and many of the things we also touched upon today. We had on board uh, then the chiefs of the ITU, I, uh, ISO, IC, IEEE, ITF. And there is a report, we'll share the link in the, in the chat. So, so all of you can take a look and just reflect on, on these open, open questions. Um, can I just say uh, sure. respond quickly to one thing you said? Um, before I came on this, uh, this uh, event today, uh, 
we did discuss uh, whether uh, we could make uh, this forum, um, the IG, IGF, uh, a liaison member to our committee. Um, and I was speaking with the, the overall chairman of the committee. Uh, and he was quite keen and possibly forming a liaison, which means that that would be a formal process and you would uh, engage uh, with, with various groups, depending on what the topic is, of course. But So that certainly is something that is of interest to uh, the chairman and, of course, myself. That's a good point. I mean, the role of the IGF in that, that's why we are all here uh, here today. That's that's definite. Um, let me see if there is anyone in Katowice who wants to pick the mic. I have to get back from uh, time to time. Yes, there is one hand up. So please, and introduce yourself, please. Uh, hi, I'm a member of a small software team and, and one comment and one question. Comment is, uh, in most cases, end user customers do not want to pay for uh, security of the digital products unless they face major incident in terms of security. Yeah, that's always very difficult to add to the software development cycle, the component of the security. But my question is related uh, nowadays, the speed of development of new software, new digital pro products are very fast and how to deal with this speed and the time frame needed to develop new policy standards on the government on the country level is is this a gap and how you think it could be solved thank you thank you excellent questions i guess million dollar questions if someone would be able to respond to that that would be great uh, but i leave it to anyone just raise a hand if you want to reflect on this and i also invite um, um, the the the, the uh, representatives from developing countries. I know Priscilla and the others are there. If anyone wants to shed a little bit more light, light from the perspective of developing countries, because I think it might be particularly hard for developing countries to catch up with the same pace that you mentioned, also on the regulatory framework uh, level. Uh, yet we see more and more uh, producers, if you wish, of uh, services, code, uh, devices, and so on, coming from Asia, Africa, and other places. So it, it, there is a need to have a a solid framework, if we wish, uh, in these parts of the world, definitely. Uh, Nila, and then anyone else who wants to jump in? Uh, yes, thank you. I think it's a, it's a very tough question. And of course, I don't have the answer to this one, one million dollar question. But just uh, two thoughts about it. I think some way to tackle it is um, to just stay very high level on a legislative, regulatory, or even standard level. So just defining objectives and, and um, leaving freedom how to, to achieve these objectives. So clearly when I, I spoke, for example, uh, with NIST, uh, the US um, um, National Standard Organization, National Institute for Standards and Technology, uh, I was surprised that they actually weren't worried at all about this question and that they said um, because they are so much more objective objective oriented they told me that that's not something that they are too much concerned about and one other issue that I found very interesting that I actually learned about uh, during this IGF is a couple of countries um, um, addressing this issues this issue by actually trying to implement regulation before the regulation is in place. So one example is the EU um, AI Act, where Spain right now tries to implement it um, already and see where it's working and where it's not working before it's actually enacted, because they expect that it's going to be probably four to five more years and they are already testing this and another example was about autonomous vehicles and the implementation of it in Dubai. Um, how they try to already look what is working and what is not working um, before they actually would try to issue certificates around this. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I think this 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 is definitely a good point, uh, Nastya. Um, thank you. I, I would just probably add one more perspective. I think um, 
um, approach and the regulation of a particular technology would depend on that particular technology when we will see that some sometimes the efforts of the regulators and the industry thus could be different it will speak about the artificial intelligence very very broadly then we see that the key efforts right now are focusing on the agreeing on a set of the ethical principles that might be also applied in the future and and in this regard maybe this one of the I don't know, either best or not really best, but still approaches to um, cover at least the next five years of when the artificial intelligence will be even more spread for different applications and devices. If we speak about the IET, then we clearly see that the IET is being approached through different, through two parallel tracks, the consumer IET and more industrial IET, which I, get, which I think the industrial IET is a part of the broader critical software, critical infrastructure, um, paradigm protection. Um, another aspect, we see that the with the emerging technologies, there's a lot of creativity uh, coming from the governments, for example, through the regulatory sandboxes. Um, and there could be some cases coming from the UK, or even from Moscow, where I um, could personally share with the self-driving cars with the company called Yandex. They actually have quite lots of the different neighbors neighboring uh, neighborhoods uh, in one of them i personally live and i see every day lots of the self-driving cars um, circling around the streets way again i live and i see that there's no one sitting on the wheelchair but there's a different technical engineer sitting and collecting all the operations um, and i know that the way how yandex approaches the self-driving cars they want to highlight that this has already been a common sort of reality and the collecting more and more use cases, how the self-driving cars are working on the daily operations, definitely they would use this information to inform the policymakers somewhere in the Russian government. So I assume, depending on the technology, we would see different approaches to regulate this technology. With emerging technologies, of course, there's a lot of questions because we this little use cases to understand how this emerging technology work but it's good that we see lots of their cre creativity approaches and lots of the openness coming from the governments um, to approach this together with the industry thanks uh, thanks nastia uh, let me uh mark carvel if you wish to jump in because you, not only because you are in the dynamic coalition as part of the igf but also because you're a person who's been with the igf for 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 Long time. Let's put it that way. Um, I think it, and of course, you have a U UK perspective. Do you think that the the IGF could play a, a more, more more active or more important role in in gathering all these stakeholders? And how do you see maybe the role of connecting all these various venues, including the Dynamic Coalition, uh, together to 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 work on this? Mark, if you can take the mic. Well, yes, thank you very much, Vlada, and um, uh, hello, everybody. It's a, a very important uh, discussions going on now, and um, indeed, uh, you know, security and safety online, uh, these are critical issues for many governments and stakeholder communities worldwide. Uh, there's no doubt about it. I mean, my experience of, from the UK government, I, I left a couple of years ago, um, but uh, yeah, you know, the UK government is has a very um, a lot of resource on uh, cybersecurity uh, and on engaging uh, the standards developing all organizations um, and uh, reaching out to uh, to business communities and so on. So there are governments, as Anastasia is uh, very, very correctly pointing out, very focused on this and, and uh, seeking to engage uh, stakeholders. Now, I'm now a policy advisor with a uh, a dynamic coalition of the IGF, um, as, as you've just um, introduced uh, uh, me as uh, Vlada. I, uh, it's led by Val Donatris, who, who's a consultant, and he did a pilot project on, on uh, security standards uh, for the IGF in 2019-20. And that led to us getting together uh, to establish a, a permanent ongoing focus for the IGF on standards, security related standards, uh, uh, and, and in particular, um, the gap between what is coming out very, very uh, constructively from the standards development community and, and the deployment of those standards. You know, the business case for the deployment is, is not clearly understood. 
Uh, there are drivers for um, uh, getting standards properly uh, designed into products, but those drivers are not uh, really understood either. It could be through procurement and supply chain um, management um, opportunities was mentioned earlier. And indeed the coalition is focused on that. So on, on security by design, uh, currently very much on the IoT uh, thread, we may well uh, progress to other uh, technologies uh, on the security by design uh, focus um, uh, and on uh, procurement and supply chain management and the business case. We've got a working group on that as well. And a third working group on awareness raising uh, through educational curricula and so on about the importance of critical standards for security and safety online. There's widely recognized um, uh, gaps in that as an opportunity for, for making people really understand, you know, it's important for these standards to be, to be deployed in their devices around the house. And with AI coming along the track and intersecting with IoT, this is going to be critically important, as we've just been saying. So we have the coalition. We've been going a year. It's early days. We're looking for much more uh, uh, contributions more contributions uh, from, from experts and participation in the working groups. We're working online, obviously. Um, and uh, we have a session this afternoon, uh, later on, uh, uh, as I mentioned in, in the chat, um, where the working groups on those specific uh, topics will be uh, reporting the chairs of those working groups. Um, so, uh, as I say, we, yeah, we're getting going. We, we are identifying areas for research. and. We are, I think, a focal point for the IGF in this area. Um, and uh, we're very much output oriented. We wanna make uh, policy options, recommendations, guidance and toolkits as a, as a new style IGF dynamic coalition, you know, producing outcomes that we want to disseminate to policymakers and decision takers worldwide. So, Please, please join us later. We also have a networking session tomorrow. Um, so you can really talk to us very informally and suggest and criticize what we're doing and uh, add ideas. We need ideas and we need participation. Thanks, Vlada, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mark. No, I think it's, it's really important to understand what venues we have within the IGF as well that we can use. Uh, and of course, there is a best practice forum as well, and uh, and uh, there are generally opportunities and, and potentials of the IGF. So I guess one thing we have to do as as the next steps is to try again connect these leading fora and uh, and uh, institutions uh, and see how we can how we can better put everything together. Uh, let me pass the floor now to my colleague Afrataska, who is uh, taking the notes and uh, trying to summarize all the, the whole discussion in a few messages. And I'm, I'm sure it's not going to be easy, Afrat, but <laughs> no, give no, a try, give a try. <laughs> Very well. So thank you, everybody, for such a rich and interesting discussion. It was really such a pleasure to hear all of your thoughts, ideas, and comments. Just sharing with you very briefly some of the main ideas and points that were made by all of you. So we basically started this whole uh, session by talking about Geneva Dialogue and about the importance of Geneva Dialogue as an initiative that aims to be practical and non-ideological non in that sense. And the overall aim of developing more actionable principles for the security of digital products. Then we talked a little bit about what's actually going, going on out there in terms of attacks and vulnerabilities. And the bottom line was that there is a need to improve transparency and to imply a more uh, responsible approach when it comes to digital products, especially given now that you know um, everything is code right now and digital products end up being part of the critical infrastructure as well. Uh, then we had a very interesting presentation of Nila which I won't summarize everything, but the main questions that were raised at the end of the presentation focused about which actors are capable of advancing policy of digital product security on an international level. And can you even hope to develop some sort of a policy that can be applicable for all types of digital products? And later on, we had the Singapore CLS initiative, which is a great example, which sort of demonstrates some of the questions that Nila brought up in her presentation. 
Uh, first of all, we have here the example of collaboration between different stakeholders within the same country, mainly the regulator and the private sector in creating labels for security uh, digital products. And at the same time, we also have this really interesting initiative and collaboration with Finland that can actually that demonstrate that states can actually be capable of collaborating with one another and bridging the gap on a more international level. Then we had Nastia talking really about um, Paris Call, and I won't summarize Paris Call, the entire document, Nastia already shared it with you, but it does highlight the need for all actors to have a, more, a role to play in creating a stronger uh, ICT supply chain security, which sort of led the way to discussion with, uh, about standardization and regulators, right, which was one of the main topics that we also talked about it quite a lot in the chat as well. Um, and then finally, we just started to, uh, unveiling the work of the Dynamic Coalition, uh, but this was the end of the session by now. Um, so these are the main points, and trust me, there are so many other points which I didn't even have the chance to incorporate, but we'll share the whole document and the whole uh, summary of it. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Efrat. Uh, and uh, a note that we are also, as, as, as Diplo and Geneva Internet Platform, we are providing or doing the reports from all the sessions at the IGF, uh, sort of just in time, and we'll also do report for this one. So stay tuned and, and, and uh, mm -hmm. follow the, the Digital Watch. Uh, and at the end, uh, uh, let me pass the floor to Jonas uh, from the, again, from the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, I mean, an instrumental person from the Swiss side for the Geneva Dialogue. So Jonas, if you want to, I don't know, summarize and, and just, you know, what, what the next steps are. Maybe that, that, that's the best question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Vlada. And great to see the and hear the, the great discussion and also that we have actually uh, participants in the room and in Katowice. Uh, um, sorry that we couldn't be closer to you this time. And, and let's hope for next year that we can all meet again. I still remember the days in Berlin when we were, we were, we were able to, to meet uh, all of us. Well, anyway, um, yeah, Geneva Dialogue, um, I think we talked a lot about it already and this session has revealed that it's really important to bring together all the relevant stakeholders, uh, uh, regulators, standardization organizations, which are working already on, um, yeah, global standards that can be applied globally and also certified globally as we learned throughout the session and as Vlada said we had a discussion a broader discussion with standardization organizations in May already and we we have to continue and and also uh, look at the challenges that 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 many companies also face when uh, when um, um, yeah international standards exist on the one hand on the other hand we have regulators that are doing their own uh, um, regulations uh, which are based on international standards but but not reflect them fully and so on so so we have identified all these challenges in the Geneva dialogue and we will continue to do so and I think we also achieved concrete outcomes with the best practices that we have in place that were also highlighted by by zone in in the in the beginning uh, like uh, threat modeling secure coding and so on and uh, going forward, I think um, what will be important, and as also Benedict Wexler has uh, highlighted in the beginning, to move cl closer to action, to, to, to take the 20 plus private sector actors that we have on board in the Geneva Dialogue, and uh, to look at how really the private sector can advance um, digital product security in a practical manner, and, and, and how we can work in sync with regulators and, and how we can design a common principles and a common way forward. I think this will be a good focus for the Geneva Dialogue in the next year. So thanks a lot. Um, thanks also to all the participants in Katowice. I wish you a great uh, day and a great forum um, ahead. And um, yeah, see you next time. Have some have some fun for us that are remote. Uh, for those of you that are in Katowice, thanks, thanks all for joining, uh, and uh, let's call it a, a day. Enjoy the day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks for organizing. Bye. Thank you. Bye.